Absolutely. Uh, good afternoon, uh, distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. I have submitted my testimony online in support of many uh, heroin and opiate uh, proposals that we've discussed, but I thought I'd use my time today to bring up uh, Teresa Doonan from Heroin Kills Connecticut, a constituent of mine from Trumbull. So I'll let her introduce herself. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Teresa Doonan, and I'm a resident of Trumbull, Connecticut. I am also the mother of a son, Alexandru, who became addicted to opiates at the age of 14 and progressed to heroin, and who died exactly two years ago today, March 7, 2014. Since that date, I have watched five of his friends die, and I have witnessed the deaths of others throughout southwestern Connecticut. I am here to support legislation to address the opiate heroin crisis affecting our state and the entire country. I am here as an advocate for all families affected by this epidemic and to assist them in the maze in which they find themselves lost. With all due respect to uh, the state and the Commissioner of Public Health, um, there is no help out there. There are lots of phone numbers on the websites and there are lots of people who answer, but there really is no definitive help. Uh, since January 2016, I personally have placed six children in uh, rehab facilities throughout the state, all residents of Trumbull, Connecticut. Um, I was a co-panelist with uh, representatives Rutegliano, Devlin, Kupchik, McGordy, and Vehi, as well as Senators Wang and Moore. I have been invited to work with local police departments as a community advocate. I am in the process of setting up a Connecticut version of Hope Soldiers, which is a countrywide network of volunteers, lawyers, doctors, medical professionals, all in the assistance of opiate heroin addiction. Um, I, while I support all the legislation on table for the opioid heroin, I specifically uh, um, and feel that, uh, yeah, Establishing murder by sale of an opioid control substance or the death by dealer law. Um, selling heroin, especially heroin mixed with fentanyl and other chemicals, is handing somebody a gun with a bullet and putting it to their head. Uh, it, will it stop the sale of it, uh, heroin? No. But it will definitely put fear into the local lower level dealers uh, for the street sales. Requiring all doctors who prescribe opiates to complete and maintain certification in addiction awareness. Restricting the amount of opioids prescribed in routine medical situations such as dental surgery. Requiring medical insurance to cover addiction as it would any other insured illness. Mandatory drug testing for certain patients on an opioid regimen to ensure compliance with use. Many dealers are patients who sell their prescriptions on the street. Education of our youth starting at the elementary level. Connecticut is in the dark ages in its handling of the drug addiction and its response to opioid heroin crisis. There are only roughly 1,200 inpatient rehab beds in the entire state. Doctors who prescribe Suboxone or other opiate replacement drugs for those who are in treatment are restricted to treating 100 Suboxone patients in their, in their practice. As a mother who has been in the trenches, who has begged courts to put her son in jail, who has begged judges to have her son ruled incompetent so that I would be able to place him in a rehab at age 16, you cannot force your child into rehab. As a mother who has spent sleepless nights driving and knocking on drug den doors looking for her son, I respectfully implore you to move swiftly and aggressively in passing the current legislature so that fewer families will suffer the same fate. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony and uh, appreciate it, Representative. And by the way, we have looked at the Suboxone issue. That is actually, unfortunately, a federal issue. They're the ones that limit under federal statute uh, what can be prescribed here. So we did look at that in committee. Any questions from the committee? I, I do want Representative to recognize that a couple of those suggestions weren't for this committee. Understood. We get that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Representative Srinivasan. Thank you, Representative, for being here. This, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Represent Representative, for being here this afternoon and for your testimony. We appreciate that. So you had mentioned in your testimony that when you, when you called on the state and when you called on the department, 
the impression that I got was you didn't get anything at all. You didn't go anywhere at all. No, you get phone numbers and names and you, but that's it. Nobody will say, well, you know, well, we'll, we'll have you look at a psychiatrist or we'll get you into a rehab, but there are no beds. So, you know, go to the emergency room and maybe they can get you in. And it's just a big circle. And so at the end of that big circle, unfortunately, you really didn't get the help. No, no that help Either at all. for your son or for the other members that you talked about, at the end of the day, there was no help that you were able to get. No, even with the, the court system, anything, there was no, there's no place to go, there's no one to talk to, there are no rehab facilities where you can take somebody in a crisis. You can go to the emergency room, but they are no longer taking um, heroin patients, Bridgeport, St. Vincent's, Griffin, and Yale have shut their Suboxone treatment because they are overwhelmed. So they are no longer taking new patients, and I call them to confirm this. Thank you. And uh, I'm sure you're well aware, you know, you talked about the opioid overdose, obviously. I mean, the concerns that we have in our state, which we are trying to address, not only in this session, we did that in the last session as well, when we have the prescription drug monitoring. Uh, you know, where our air healthcare provider who prescribes these medications automatically has rules and regulations that he, he or she have to follow, and they're, and they're very closely monitored. We did run into some hiccups in terms of the rolling out of the program, but working well with the commissioner, uh, 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 we have been able to at least resolve most of the issues. So do you think that PMP program that is now out there is adequate in no. terms of, of, uh, of restricting the use of these medications, or do you feel that even what we have, which we already just unrolled, is not adequate in controlling the opioid use or prescriptions? I think there are two sides. Um, there's the long-term side, which addressing the prescription of opioids is one hand, but we're in a crisis. We're in an emergency mode. Um, this isn't something to sit around for two or three years talking about passing this or doing that. It's, it's, like, it's almost like a, a state emergency. There's no money, there are no funds, and everything that has been passed is all really good for the future and as it goes on, but for the immediate crisis, it has no impact whatsoever. So this PMP program, which is current right now, and it is actually live as far as the pharmacists are concerned in terms of having to report and monitor, even that you think will not have any impact as we speak today, tomorrow? It will have a slight impact um, to the people who are selling their prescriptions um, coming from. Well, I, th I think it also has to be noted that the doctors actually have to use the system we don't know how many doctors are actually going on the system and checking to see what the prescription rate is for that particular patient. We are hearing that, you know, it's not fully integrated yet. They're not fully reporting or checking. Um, so there may be some issues there, and over time that might get corrected. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you all for, for your testimony today. We appreciate it. Thank you.